Good morning, my name is Kendra Sales, and I'm Teresa Kolek. And I'm Sandy Ingber. And we're sitting down today to discuss um, Great Minds in Nursing. This is a project to investigate uh, how nursing leaders contribute to our field. So we have a few questions. Okay, right. <laughs> um, the first of which, uh, if you don't mind, to just, just state uh, your current title right now. I am Associate Dean for Graduate Clinical Education. Okay. Um, this doesn't have to be a lengthy description, but if you could just describe the work that you've done um, and your career in nursing, and how did you end up uh, merging into your current position right now? Well, my career in nursing has been long, <laughs> longer than I sometimes would have been. But I started out in clinical and working as in ICU, and then in the 19... 70s when nurse practitioner programs were starting. I was transitioning. I worked as a staff nurse in the intensive care unit and then worked as a clinical supervisor over several ICUs and then thought that I needed a change and my goal was really to teach critical care because I love critical care at that point in time. And uh, but an opportunity came along and someone was starting where I happened to be working and they wanted to start an emergency primary care nurse practitioner program. It was at the very beginning of nurse, the nurse practitioner movement. All nurse practitioner programs pretty much in those days were certificate programs and this was a hospital system. And so the uh, director of the emergency department approached me and said, would you consider doing this? And I thought, well, this sounds interesting. <laughs> so I agreed to do it, and I did that for probably about 10 years. And then uh, in the meantime, I did a fair amount of speaking nationally about emergency issues, about critical care. And met a number of people. I met somebody who happened to teach here and who said, um, we're looking for someone with your skills to teach part-time in our occupational health course. And at that point, I was going, thinking about coming back to school. And so I interviewed for that position. I was getting ready to start my Ph.D. program. And I actually did not plan to teach during as in the Ph.D. program. I actually planned to be a full-time student, but <laughs> they were starting a... So this is, this is a very, very career, as you will soon realize. <laughs> uh, probably not the way people recommend that you develop your academic career. But I, they were starting a, a, a geriatric MP program, and they had interviewed people from around the country and couldn't find anyone that they really wanted to teach it, and so asked me if I would be willing to coordinate that program. So mm -hmm. instead of being a full-time PhD student, I was a part-time PhD student and coordinated the geriatric program. And then once I finished my PhD, that program ended, um, and that was here. And then I accepted a, a postdoc position with a faculty member who was doing continence research. I was working part-time as a nurse practitioner, first in the nursing home, and then at the Bennett of Geriatric Center in the continence program. And my dissertation focused on urinary incontinence and older women's beliefs about urinary incontinence. It was done as part of a larger uh, research project in the Graduate School of Public Health where, that identified women with incontinence. That I followed up interviewing them in, in five rural counties in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so at that point, she had got an NIR grant looking at. Uh, pelvic floor muscle training for urinary incontinence in homebound elders, so frail elders, something that had not been done previously. And so I went, after I finished my PhD, to be basically a postdoc on that project. And when that project was ending, um, I did that right through the latter part of my PhD and post-PhD, worked on that project. And then um, Pitt offered me, again, a faculty position coordinating women's health nurse practitioner program. So many, many nurse practitioner programs in my history. And so I did that for a couple of years, and then the department chair, I've been in health promotion and development, retired, and they asked me if I would consider accepting that position. 
So I did that for 11 years as a department chair. And then the dean asked me, uh, I guess about three years ago, if I would consider this position as associate dean. Originally for all clinical education, but in January we hired someone to assume responsibility for the undergraduate clinical education. So I now am just graduate students. So. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So what do you do in your current role right now? So right now my role is um, I work with faculty I, primarily around student and curricular related issues. So anything related to the graduate curriculum I'm involved in, like we recently had a CCNE site visit, an accreditation visit for our DMP program, so I was pretty heavily involved in the preparation for that accreditation. Any student problems in the, it has been up until January in any of the programs except the PhD, where you know there's a student issue, academic integrity, unsafe clinical practice, I, that ends up down here in this office. And any faculty who are need some expert opinion on how to handle particular student issues, I'm involved in the various curriculum committees, councils. Those things. Great, thank, you. thank mm -hmm. you for that explanation. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about your research, and you already got at some of this information, but. How would you describe your leadership in nursing in the healthcare field? Or as it pertains to your research. Okay, to my research. So, you know, my, I am, I consider myself a clinician. Uh, and so, much of my research has grown out of my uh, interest in patient care and in trying to improve patient care. And by the time I was starting my dissertation, you know, I think like many people starting their dissertation at the point that I did or coming into a PhD program. I don't think I really had a clear idea of what direction I should be going at that point because my background was critical care, my background was emergency medicine. I was particularly interested in you know, how nurses make decisions and how that influences patient outcomes. But once I got into the PhD program, you know, I got some wise advice that I needed to really think about what's going to be fundable and what's going to allow me to develop a nursing career. And so while I was a PhD student, I was working at, at, over at the Benenden Geriatric Center in the incontinence clinic. And so that's really sort of how my interest in urinary incontinence started. And as I said, to proof my postdoc, then uh, to my own re research and individual research, you know, with my team in the area of urinary incontinence, trying to improve continence care. Urinary incontinence is a huge problem in the, for the geriatric population, particularly for frail elders. Um, I'm just going to ask one follow-up question with that. You really hit on a lot of our questions about the significance and the gaps that your research is addressing, but could you talk a little bit about if your research has been able to impact state and national policies in any way? The research that I and that my team and other people have done, I think, have supported the use of conservative therapy, meaning basically pelvic floor muscle training and behavioral therapies uh, for urinary incontinence. And I don't know, I don't think as an individual my research has changed in policy, but in combination with research done by other investigators in this area, I think it's had an impact on you know, policy. Some of the questions that I was going to ask next still relate to policy, but I think you just addressed that. Um, so overall, what would you say, uh, if you had to pick out maybe a few things, what are the biggest impacts, the things that you would delineate as um, being the most important to making uh, health care better for your population? How, how has your role contributed to that, and how do you continue to contribute to that? Well, I think, you know, I sort of see myself at this stage of my career as primarily in a mentor role, okay, okay to try to improve health care by mentoring younger 
researchers and younger faculty members to develop research. Uh, I, you know, I think um, you know, I am an, an associate editor on a journal uh, that is the Lewandowski and Continent Journal. I'm pretty active in that society, and I am the Continent section editor for that journal. So I do a lot of reviewing of manuscripts. You know, it, it is a society where our, most of our membership is clinicians, and our goal really is to try to mentor them in developing research skills and publication skills. And so I do a lot. That is one way that I think I mentor. I am I have a joint appointment at the University of Basel in Switzerland where my time there is really spent mentoring, mentoring doctoral students and postdoctoral students, developing and carrying out research projects in a variety of areas, not not in but in a variety of different areas. So do you see that mentoring role then as being basically the primary springboard at this point from which you will um, leave behind a lasting legacy in this? I hope so. Yes. I hope so. There you are, from the work that you've done and from this mentoring role in which you have so much investment and interest, um, so from your own perspective, from your own work, and that of the students whom you oversee, how do you see this, this work impacting the healthcare system? Well, most of that, yeah. So the projects that I have been currently involved with, and students or other groups in Switzerland, I think are, um, have an opportunity to positively impact, I think, healthcare in Switzerland as well as in the EU. You know, we have been involved in a number of different projects related to transplant care. I mean, I, I sort of see my, my role in most of these things is not necessarily the content expert, mm -hmm. but I have a fair amount of methodologic mm -hmm. expertise, and so I am able to advise people on some pretty diverse projects to make sure that research projects are designed in such a way that you actually can answer a question that you would actually have data that is potentially useful. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, are there any projects, say, that you're more intimately involved in right now that say to you, yes, this is going to impact healthcare systems, this is going to impact uh, perhaps not policy, you've already addressed that, that, that just strike you as, as saying you know, that this has real potential to change things? Or have there been projects in the past that you've seen that happen? Real gems, I guess I'll say. Okay. Um, now I think one of the projects that I worked with students and a postdoc on in Switzerland was a project looking at neonatal pain in the NICU. Mm -hmm. And so this was a project that we hope will, will influence, or we hope will influence how pain is managed in, in neonates, in the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, it was funded by the Swiss uh, National Science Foundation and looked at some interventions, compared several interventions in terms of pain control. Uh, the doctoral student uh, that I worked with also looked at some of the uh, characteristics associated with how these preterm neonates respond to pain. Think, you know, heightening the awareness of pain is a big issue and a bigger issue than we once thought in this population. And there are effective ways of trying to decrease that pain. You know, with those very sick babies, there's a trade-off between what you, the risk of the intervention and the benefit of the intervention that has to be weighed, I think, pretty carefully. I just wanted to ask a follow-up sure. question on your international experience. Yes. I think it's the amazing or unusual the amount of international collaborations that you have. Could you talk about a little bit how you got involved in yes. the international collaborations and maybe how it's different than collaborating with investigators in the United States? Well, you know, it's again one of those things that um, I think many things in my career I have to say. I was in the right place at the right time, an opportunity came along, and I took advantage of it. 
So my uh, postdoc research mentor, who was here in the School of Nursing, was had was just retiring at the time that the University of Basel started the Institute of Nursing Science over there, and they actually she actually was involved initially in. Um, helping them develop a physical assessment course because she was a nurse practitioner like I am a nurse practitioner. And so they that's something that was pretty new over there, the whole concept of advanced practice nursing. It's still not like we think of advanced practice nursing here. Uh, but I think the whole concept was new and so they didn't have anyone with the expertise. And uh, the person who was running that program had spent some time as a postdoc with the RD. And so when she was getting ready to start the program, she approached the dean and said, do you have someone you can suggest? The dean wasn't the dean then, but she approached her and said, do you have someone you can suggest? And so she recommended my mentor, uh, Joanne McDowell, because she was retiring in Joe, and she thought this might be something interesting for Joanne to do. So that's really how I got involved. So initially, I went over there to assist them with, a, with evaluating the students at the end of the first course. And then I went back again, maybe a year later, to teach a, sum, a summer course, which they have over there. And while I was there, I someone had a grant that they were getting ready to submit, and they asked me if I would mind working with this person and helping them to revise this grant, which need, needed considerable revision. So I did that with her, and then that grant was submitted, and it got funded. And then I was on, you know, so it sort of evolved over time. I was on a dissertation committee for one of the students over there, and then over a several, uh, the course of a couple of years, they asked me what, if I would consider actually having a more formal relationship with them and a joint appointment, and so with permission of the dean here. I accepted that position and have been doing it for a number of years. And through them, I've had an opportunity to be involved in a lot of very interesting projects with their doctoral students, with their postdocs, and then uh, part right now of a larger, a large international group looking at doing a systematic review, looking at how behavioral outcomes influence long-term outcomes or behavioral factors influence long-term outcomes after solid organ transplantation. So this is a large systematic review being done by a group of people from uh, a number of countries. You know, short-term outcome has improved drastically after solid organ transplant, but long-term outcome hasn't improved nearly as much. So one of the things that we're looking at is are certain behaviors like adherence physical activity, smoking, alcohol, are they, what, what kind of evidence is there out there in the literature to suggest that these may have a positive impact on long-term outcomes. So I've had an opportunity to get involved in with things like that as a result of this activity. And I've taken, taken our undergraduate students for travel abroad experiences to Switzerland several times. So is there just any other information you'd like to share providing your program of research, your scholarship, or your clinical practice? I, um, I don't currently, I did work as a nurse practitioner up until the time that, um, shortly before I accepted this position. I don't work clinically part-time as an MP anymore. Um, that I think, you know, that's a very grat was always a very gratifying thing, but at some point time becomes an issue when you have research grants and when you have administrative responsibility and I was traveling. So uh, but I think, you know, a lot of my, my research I feel has all been informed by clinical practice, which I I think is to me a valuable. Do you have anything else? That, um, do you have any advice for those who are going to be watching this video out there? Maybe current graduate students, aspiring graduate the students. students. Right. You know, I, yeah, I think 
while my career has probably been different than a lot of academic careers are perhaps not, you know, my first half of my career was all clinical. And then, you know, sort of divided in two. So I have to say I'm not a person who has had a path in one area for my entire career. It's been quite varied. Um, at one point in time, I have to say when I was probably thinking in my first faculty position about the idea of going up for tenure, I thought it's going to be very difficult for me to show a career path that has been focused because <laughs> my career path has not been focused. But, you know, I think on the other hand, it's been a really interesting career. I've basically taken advantage of when someone has come to me across the course of my career and said, you know, we have this idea, we think you'd be a really good person to do this. What do you think? Most of the time I take advantage of that. I have taken advantage of that. And, you know, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's made for a great career. Um, whether, I'm sure other people uh, have taken very different pathways and been probably very successful with them. But I've enjoyed everything I've done in nursing. That's one of the things that I think is great, is that there are so many opportunities that um, come along, and I think you know, it's taking advantage of those opportunities and doing the best you can while you're involved in them. Well, thank you for chatting yep. with us today. Sure. We appreciate it. Yes, and we really enjoy hearing about your career, and I think it's a great example of all the ways nurses can impact practice, really through their clinical practice, through their teaching, right. and through their research. And you really had a nice combination of it all, right. both nationally and internationally. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.